Now we're ready to begin working on our most accurate load. In order to do this, first we need to identify those ballistic variables that affect the accuracy of muzzle loaders. First is the interior condition of the bore. The second variable is the weight and size of the round balls. Then the next one is the amount and granulation of powder, the compressed thickness of your patching fabric, and the type and amount of lubricant that you place into those patches. In order to eliminate the human errors as much as possible, shoot your test targets from a stable bench rest using front and rear sandbags. Be as consistent as you can in the way you hold the rifle, align the sights, and squeeze the trigger. You also want to be consistent with the way you measure your powder in your powder measure. I like to slightly overfill that measure and then level it off when I turn the, load, the pouring spout that's attached to the measure over. If you don't have that pour spout, use a straight edge like the back of your knife. Remember not to shake or tap on the powder measure when you fill it. If you do that, the powder settles and you'll get inconsistent charge weights. Also, be consistent with the pressure you place on the powder charge with when you seat the ball with your ramrod. Try to do that the same way each and every time. Okay, so how do we control these variables and test them? The first one I mentioned, the internal condition of the bore. Certainly you're all aware that every shot you fire in a muzzle loading gun builds up another layer of powder fouling inside the bore. This can lead to vertical stringing on your target. As the amount of powder fouling increases, the friction in the bore increases and this affects your velocity. And what you will see is each shot successively hitting the target higher and higher. Now we want to avoid this by wiping the bore of the gun between shots with a dry or very slightly damp patch one time, in and out. Our purpose is not to clean the bore, but to leave the same amount of fouling inside the bore of that rifle for each and every shot. Now you can accomplish this by using either a smaller cleaning patch or a slightly smaller cleaning jag. I like to put my cleaning jag in my electric drill and file it down while I rotate it in the drill until a dry patch will just pass down and back out the bore. Now it's important that you do not neglect wiping the bore between shots if you want to see consistent results on your target. The next variable that we need to control is the size and the weight of the round ball. For example, in a 50 caliber rifle, you can purchase swedged round balls in sizes from 495 to 490 and 480. You might decide that you would start with the 490 and a 10 thousandths patch. This usually won't be the most accurate load in a, in a rifle, but it is a good place to start. With your experimentation, you may find that your rifle shoots best with a combination of a larger ball and a thinner patch, or perhaps a smaller ball and a thicker patch. The other thing about the round balls that can be very inconsistent is their weight. If you take a box of 100 balls and you weigh each one on your scales, you will find that there are some that are much lighter than most of the balls in that box, and there may even be a few that are heavier. Now, if the molecular weight of lead is consistent, what accounts for these differences in weights? Well, with the lightweight balls, they typically have an air pocket or a void inside that ball. Unless that void happens to be perfectly centered, that ball will wobble in flight 
and produce a flyer on your target. It's essential that we eliminate those balls or we will not know if the flyers on our targets are a result of the variable that we're testing or just an out of spec round ball. So it's important to eliminate those from the round balls that you're going to shoot while testing. On the other hand, you may find some balls that are much heavier than those other balls. Well, obviously those contain more lead. So how can this be? If you're casting your own round ball, as your hand tires from holding those handles together, you may not get the mold closed completely, and this would cause a larger ball. The other thing that can happen on your mold is the cutoff lever that cuts your sprue from the ball can be, get loose on that mold. And this would allow the sprue to be larger, which of course would make that ball heavier. Now even among the swedged balls, these are not all formed in the same mold. There's an entire production line. And if one of those molds happens to be a slight bit larger, and, and I've even seen this in double cavity molds, casting my own, that uh, one mold might be slightly, almost immeasurably larger than the other cavity, and those balls won't weigh the same. But in any event, if that ball is larger because that mold could be larger, it's going to fit tighter in the bore and compress the patch more than those other balls in that shot string and this too can produce a flyer. So what you want to do is eliminate the lightweight balls and the heavyweight balls by sorting them out on your scales and you want to shoot your test targets with those balls in the middle that weigh exactly the same. In this way you can be assured that any variation in your groups on target is a result of the variable that you're testing and not caused by inconsistencies in the weight and size of your round ball. Now before we begin shooting our rifle, we're going to need to decide which granulation of black powder to use. We're looking at three granulations of GoX powder. On the left is 4F. It's the smallest granulation, in other words, it's the finest, and it is intended to be used as the priming charge in a flintlock. It is not to be used as the main charge of any gun. In the center is 3F granulation. This is the granulation recommended for small caliber rifles up to say 50, gra uh, 50 caliber. And it's also the powder that's used in revolvers and pistols. On the right, I have a can of 2F granulation. This is usually the best powder for rifles larger than 50 caliber, shotguns, and smooth bores. Now, I have several rifles in 50 and 54 caliber, and I have found that those recommendations are not a hard and fast rule. Some of my 50 caliber rifles shoot very well with 3F, a few shoot better with 2F, and the same is true of my 54 caliber rifles. One of those rifles shoots excellent groups with 2F powder. My Hawking rifle, that's also a 54 caliber, shoots its best groups with the most consistent ignition with the 3F powder. So choose a granulation of powder depending upon the caliber of your rifle. Decide which brand of powder you're going to use and stick with that brand. 